I think when Kurt began to write about himself and his family, another song from that era which Steve Fist produced was Been a Son, you know, a song I think about a sister uh, who in her gender struggles for identity. Uh, when he began to turn to his own turf, I think he really became a more powerful songwriter. Competition was really tough, with a lot of young bands fighting for supremacy. In those challenging early days, Nirvana performed better in the studio than live. On the scene, their reputation at first was not distinguished uh, in performance. They were not good performers until a couple years after, at least a couple years after they began. Then they got good towards the end, but uh, they were not distinguished performers. Their, their first performance at the Vogue, for instance, uh, which was attended by a very few distinguished Seattle Seamsters, was not auspicious. Um, it was on record that they were impressive, and particularly Cobain's songwriting gift was absolutely distinctive. It was, it was astounding. I had listened to uh, a number of records cut in Seattle, and nobody could match him. It was a one-man phenomenon, really, uh, at, at the start. The, the Seattle scene was, was Kurt Cobain. After only 30 hours in the studio, Nirvana had finally managed to record enough material to release their first album. Taken from the Bleach Your Works AIDS prevention poster, Bleach was released by Sub Pop in June 89, with little ceremony and zero marketing spend. Nirvana found themselves on a series of ill-promoted West Coast tours, with other Sub Pop stablemates Mudhoney and Tad, playing to tiny crowds, sleeping on cold floors, and virtually begging for food. Kurt didn't like the fact that Sub Pop, at the time, Mudhoney was Sub Pop's main project. That was who they hyped to the ends of the earth. And he didn't like that. I mean, it's weird to even say it now, because Mudhoney, a lot of people don't even know who Mudhoney is. But at the time, Mudhoney, I remember Kurt was the opening act on the, the Lame Fest, the Moore Theater and Tad and Mudhoney were up above him. He didn't like that. Unsurprisingly, the album bombed. But salvation came from an unexpected corner. Sub Pop paid for a few British music journalists to fly over and witness the tour. Excited by what they had discovered, a new musical Next Big Thing buzz appeared in the UK music press, ceremoniously labelled the Seattle grunge scene. They flew over, who was that guy from Melody Maker from England? Everett True, I think his name was, or something like that. And he did a lot of hype in England. So in Britain, all these sub-pop bands were supposedly huge, Mudhoney and Nirvana and things like that. And so the kind of word of mouth kind of spread back to here, and it made them bigger and bigger. And then they were actually talking about, yeah, Kurt's going to sign with Geffen. In truth, Nirvana were always a lot more pop than their sub-pop hard-punk colleagues, but were happy for any exposure, and Julie went along with all the hype. In some ways, Nirvana was actually one of the most unlikely bands to make it big, partially because they came from Aberdeen, they weren't as tied into the Seattle music scene, and uh, partially because by the music that they did, it was a little bit different than some of the other bands. They, they weren't quite as uh, punk always. They had more pop elements. But of course, that's what made them go huge, because once you mix that pop element in, and you can get ballads that can be on the radio, like Come As You Are, you suddenly have an album that's really a juggernaut. 